So I, I suppose, as a neuroscientist, I'm just fascinated by how the brain may be responsible for the behavior that we observe. So it's the early days yet. Cognitive neuroscience really only emerged in the last 20, 30 years. So it's a joining together of experimental psychology and basic neuroscience. And the idea is to look at structure and function. What structures of the brain are responsible for the behaviors we observe. We've got a long way to go, by the way. We're nowhere near understanding the human mind. Uh, and I'll show some examples further back. Um, I'm going to focus on touch. I'm going to tell you about a sense of touch that you sort of know about sort of subconsciously, but not, not necessarily consciously. Uh, and here, this example really is just to show that all, all animals uh, sort of are, uh, you know, responsive to the kind of affiliative touch that you'll see between all mammals, in fact. And I'll even show you that for a little worm. And in fact, if touch were not rewarding, if it were not pleasant to be touched or to touch, then we wouldn't even make babies and babies wouldn't be able to be cared for. So there's something about the behavior that's driving the reward that Janet talks about, about touch, that needs to be understood. And I have to admit, I just find it very sad that we've reached this position where people have to talk about permission for touch. And I don't know, Janet pointed out that something happened uh, in the 50s or 60s with inappropriate touch, and then the legislation comes down like a, like a sledgehammer and stops the very natural behavior of interacting touch between people. So what I want to do is put the science right up front here and just without any prejudice describe how important physical touch is to an infant and to all of us. If you just look at some of these clips here. I gave a talk to the British Psychological Society last year um, and I was making the point that to not touch a child is a form of abuse. Now of course that got me a whole lot of heat because if you google McGlone abuse and touch you know you're gonna pick, <laughs> you're gonna pick up me. But I was making a very serious point. This, this was reported in the Timely Educational Supplement. It got me on to uh, BBC News. And just look at this first clip, by the way. Kind of reassurance is actually part of that whole interaction between the carer outside the role of the family. And there's no harm in that, you know. And we do. Research has shown that that gentle touch on the shoulder can. <laughs> <laughs> now, when it came to her turn to talk, she was some big sort of wig in Manchester going around troubleshooting disturbed schools. Even that was inappropriate. So she was instructing her teachers that any form of touch to a pupil was, was basically the bottom. Uh, so you see what a crazy world we have we seem to have turned up in. Once you make something potentially litigative, yeah, you open up a whole opportunity for people to make money out of claiming that you were inappropriately touched. We need to be very careful about this balance. What I want to do is just re put that balance back <coughs> in the perspective of a basic scientist, okay? So if we look at the disciplines relevant to the research in touch, you can see there's a whole array of different areas where touch can be investigated by different scientific disciplines. As a neuroscientist, and this is the bottom line on my talk actually, is that via nurturing touch, a system, and I will explain in more detail as I go through what these various terms are, a system of unmyelinated cutaneous afferents shaped the destiny of the social brain. Now, that unmyelinated cutaneous afferent is a sensory nerve, okay? And I'll explain a little bit more about the sensory nerves in the skin that tell your brain about the things that happen in your body. Everything is derivable in terms of mechanisms, in terms of the sensory processes that govern anything that happens on your body. I want to start with this video because it always sort of rocks me a bit. And what I want to communicate from this is just how devastating a lack of touch is and how powerful it is as a way of controlling human behavior. This is some lunatic who set up a Marxist-Leninist cult 
and kept uh, the family a bit like Fritz in, 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 in Austria. These, guys, these, these kids never saw anybody else. They were locked in this cult and they were being inducted by the guy that's head up. He's in jail now and, sent, and, and serving a life sentence. But who you're, what you're here talking now is Katie, I think as a 12, 13 year old, reading a diary entry that she made when she was a little girl at three or four, I think, where she's relating her experiences then without knowing the world outside because she didn't see a world outside. This is an intuitive response in this little kid about what this guy was doing to her. So she's Comrade Prem. October the 8th, 1992. Comrade Bala said about four guidelines if Comrade Prem touches anybody. One, if Comrade Prem touches comrades and tries to hug or hold anybody, especially her, comrades should warn her twice. If she does not stop, comrades have to go to the kitchen and get the stick and beat her. Two, pull her ears and warn her we will twist them off. He won't want to ever go anywhere near her, leave alone, touch or hug her. And that included my mum. She was not allowed to, we were not allowed to hug. And it was so cruel because it was very painful as well. But I, sometimes I wanted to have a hug and I, sometimes I think how hard it must have been for my mum not to be able to hug me at all. How the hell can you deny any child what that kid instinctively wanted? And what she didn't recognise and what I'm going to explain is that there's a mechanism that, that, that actually is responsible for that feeling that she had. So let's just do a little bit of didactic stuff first. This word somatosensation is very simple, it's body senses. There's a whole area of science that basically we've been working on maybe for a hundred years to understand the sensory systems that are in our skin. And I've got some slides in here, by the way, that aren't in your notes. <clears throat> Uh, so if you looked in any textbook even now, the skin senses have receptors for touch, temperature, pain and itch. Okay? So there are specific receptors in the skin of your body that will respond to a tactile stimulus, a thermal stimulus, a painful one and itch. Okay? What has been discovered, this is really recently, it's 1990s by my Swedish colleagues, that they found another channel another sensory nerve in the skin that basically responds to what you would describe as pleasant touch. So this isn't some psychological phenomena. There's a nerve in the skin that's evolved to respond to gentle touch. It's there. It's there in all social mammals. If we now look at, again, this standard textbook, most of what we understand, and I'll now just focus on touch, is really from the hand. Yeah? The hand is seen as the most important object in the somatosensory system. It's a bit like the fovea of the eye, where you get most visual discrimination in a spot in the eye called the fovea. The human hand is the hand at which we basically get most information about the texture of an object, the temperature of an object, the shape of something. This is all the way we explore the environment. And of course, the hand is, is absolutely innovative with a phenomenal amount of little receptors that enable you to sort of detect the texture of fine sandpaper or a piece of fur, etc. That mechanism of able to detect the surface properties of something can only happen through receptors in the skin that encode that physical world and send it up to the brain. So we've got this recognition that the skin senses are discriminative. And by discriminative, I mean they're telling you about whether that's rough, whether that's cold, whether that's smooth. That's a discriminative sensory property, and that's really most of what people know about touch is that, yeah? that it's serving a discriminative property anywhere on the body that something touches you, you know that that touch has happened. Another little bit about the anatomy that we need to get our heads round is that the class and type of nerve fibres that are responsible for discriminative touch, and I'll come to that again in a second, are called myelinated nerves. Now, myelin is a trick that the nervous system has developed in order to send information to the brain very quickly. So a myelinated nerve transmits information in a matter of 
a few hundred milliseconds. And myelin enables inflammation to get into the nervous system really quickly. These are all myelinated nerves. And the second that you touch someone or, or you, feel, you feel touch, there's no gap between that touch happening and you feeling it because that myelinated nerve is with the information right up to your brain and you feel touch. Okay? And that's the system that most of the textbooks will be telling us about. However, there's another sense of touch that we have been working on relatively recently. And this touch is coded by a population of unmyelinated afferents. Now, unmyelinated afferents don't have this sheath that enables information to get into the nervous system quickly. They're called C fibers. And basically, you have three classes of C fibers in your skin. One, nociceptors. Two, pruroceptors, i.e. those are the ones that will tell you that, you, you, that, that, that you've got the itch. And the third one is the one I'm going to focus on today. It, if you like, it's called a hedonoceptor. This is the nerve fiber that basically tells the brain that something pleasant, that stroking touch, is rewarding. And again, I want to pick up on uh, the comment that, that we made earlier with Janet about context. We can come to that later. The difference about these, these nerve fibers, by the way, is the discriminative ones go to a part of the brain that basically analyzes that input. C fibers plug into parts of the brain that are basically processing emotion. So the anatomy determines the function. I think the easiest way I can explain this is, is, is using pain. Another C fiber, if you burn yourself or if you put your finger on a hot plate inadvertently, you instinctively pull back reflexly, okay? So we have two pain systems, a fast one and a slow one. The fast one is myelinated. So if I touch my finger on a hot plate, I instinctively pull back. I may swear, but that's about it, yeah? It's just a sharp, pricking kind of sensation. But if you've ever done that, you know that one or two seconds later, yeah, that's a C fiber. And that C fiber is taking that emotional quality of pain into those areas of the brain that are basically driving some protective behavior. Yeah? You're going to go away, you're going to huddle and cuddle it. This C tactile fiber is exactly the same. If someone touches you, the fast touch system will recognize that somebody's touched me. Depending on context and how gentle that touch is, something will waft in afterwards. And that's this C fiber that responds to a pleasant touch that we're going to focus on today. So just a few slides as to why study touch. So this is just some basic 101 stuff. We know it's the largest sensory system. Touch allows us to explore and manipulate the world. And in many senses, you know, if you like these, you know, you get these amazing vases of silk flowers. You don't quite believe that they're not real. You'll use touch as a confirmation of what the physical property of that, that, that flower is, because the visual system is failing in that sense. I'm going to come back to Harlow's monkeys, but this is one of the earliest indications that there's something absolutely critical in the development of an infant in terms of its seeking comfort through. Now, Harlow knew nothing about these nerve fibers I'm talking about today. He inferred the behavior of this infant monkey wanting to cling to a surrogate mother that had no reward with it at all, where this infant should be is at the petrol pump, yeah? This infant should be here hanging onto the fuel because that developing brain is absolutely avaricious for, for, for reward, yeah? It wants food. This is the main reward, you would have thought, where all the food is. But no, it spends very little of its time here. It's clinging to this useless soft surrogate. Well, we say useless. We now know, or we would hypothesize, that the reward associated with the cling to this is soft, gentle touch. And this is where this nerve fiber that I'm talking about today, we suggest, is driving that behavior. So, that's I've already said that. So why is touch important? Well, again, there's a tactile exploration, of course, but there's also a social value. There are ways that we can reduce touch, if you like, into a laboratory environment where we can measure all the various properties of tactile receptors in terms of their ability uh, to, or your sensitivity, if you like, to, to be able to determine or detect that something is actually on your body, uh, or the sensitivity particularly of the fingertips and the tip of the tongue. 
These are the most exquisitely sensitive body parts in terms of touch and tactile discrimination. Discriminative touch, not affective or emotional. And if you've only got to see anybody reading Braille, it's absolutely phenomenal how a blind person who's learnt Braille can read dots quicker than you can read words. Now this is again only because these discriminative mechanoreceptors in the digits have that amazing ability to encode the spatial properties of a Braille stimulus. I'm going to focus a great deal on this at some stage, but um, most, a lot of what we are understanding about the role of pleasant touch has come from animal research. Uh, and this is also translating into what intuitively we've known this for decades, if not centuries, that nurturing and touching an infant child is good for its development. But sometimes we're losing sight of how important that is, particularly with preterm infants. And I'll give you some data later that shows all that. Um, and again, we see how touch is ubiquitous, you know, the massive spa industry, the whole, you know, there's a, there's a picture I saw the other day with, with Trump and Kim Jong, you know, hugging each other. And it was all, you know, touch up here. We'll come to how important that is. And of course, you've got Clay's kiss. <clears throat> Again, I don't want to spend too much time on the discriminative touch, other than just give you a sense that this thing that you know as touch is actually mediated by a whole range of complex little receptors in the skin. And you can look upon these things as little microphones. Yeah? Whenever you pick up an object and feel something, the only reason you detect it and can analyze its texture and its temperature and its other properties is that these little microphones are basically decoding what you've handled, transducing that into an electrical signal that goes to the brain. And there's different types of receptors depending on the receptor position in the skin, whether it's close to the surface or whether it's deep down. You can get all this stuff on YouTube. It's easy just to get the bone up on basic touch. The reason I want to show this, because what's really important in this talk, is the fact that there are two types of skin. And this is very relevant, again, to what I'm talking about in terms of the anatomy. You've got what's called glabrous skin. Now, glabrous skin is basically the palms of your hand and the soles of your feet. Okay? Now, this is the body site, as I said earlier, we know most about, the fingers, the digits. The rest of your body is classified as hairy skin. Now, you may not think there's any hairs on it, but you get a microscope and there is. The rest of the body is classified as hairy skin. This nerve fibre that I'm talking about today that likes to be stroked, that we are hypothesising, is the neurobiological basis for pleasant affective touch is not here. We have never found these nerve fibers in glabrous skin. We only find them in hairy skin. Now this links to, I think to some extent, what Janet was, was describing. If you touch yourself, there's no C tactile afferents here, but there are on the body surface that you're touching. So in a sense, this is a stroking tool that's working out your CTs in a way that somebody else would. Yeah? So just bear that in mind. It's the anatomy, and I can't quite work at what's going on here, by the way. And we've tried with a couple of brain imaging experiments. If I asked you to put your hand on your face and ask you where you felt touch, and I'm going to load you with the answer now. Most of you feel touch at the touch surface rather than the surface that you're touching with. Now, that, doesn't, that makes no sense to me anatomically. Because this is the fever of the touch system. Yeah? This has got thousands of receptors in here that are exquisitely sensitive. So if you touch yourself, you should feel touch here. But you don't. You feel it here. Now that gives another indication to something that I'm building on. We won't worry about this. This is just the nerves. Just to end this discriminative story, if we look at the way that your body is represented in the brain, you get this distortion of the amount of cortical tissue or analytical uh, power is allocated disproportionately to your body. So this is the brain's view of your body, this homunculus. And what we see here is far more cortical processing power is allocated to the lips and the hands than to the rest of the body. Now this is a, this is a reflection of the number of receptors in the fingers and the lips 
and therefore the number of neurons in the brain that need to process that information. So this is our highest discriminative property, so with the fingers and the lips, and we get a homunculus character where the brain allocates far more processing power to those body parts that have more receptors. Now that will become relevant later when I talk about the hedonic homunculus. And just to reinforce that it's very important that we get this story about fast and slow. These are myelinated nerves. I mean, some of you may well know people with multiple sclerosis. And what's happening there is the myelin in the central nervous system is degenerating. Everything basically starts failing. Yeah? So the consequences of myelin failing are catastrophic in the central nervous system. But these nerves in the peripheral nervous system have different degrees of myelin. And this is an evolutionary trick, as I've said earlier, to get information into the brain quicker. These C-fibers, they evolved first. Yeah? In evolutionary time, C-fibers predate myelinated nerve fibers. And again, another important lesson today is that not only the C-tactile afferent that I'm focusing on, but the nociceptor and the proreceptor, these three C-fibers evolved primarily a protective role. Yeah? They all protect now, in evolutionary terms, the first thing you need to do as, a, as an organ is developing is to protect it. Yeah? So the C-fiber systems go down first. Once the protection's in place, you can get off your rock and you can start exploring. Then you need fast stuff because things are coming at you. You may want to catch prey, etc. So in, in a sort of sense, we can see how these C-fibers, they may be evolutionarily old, but they're certainly as important now as they were in the earlier stages of development. And I think, again, just to get your head around this marginalization thing and speed of conduction, these motor nerves, which are the fastest myelinated nerves, are basically firing information into your brain or from your brain to a muscle at the speed of an aircraft. The A-beta ones, the one that we're talking about in touch, they're about as fast as a Formula 1 racing car. So when you're touched, these nerve fibers get this information in. These C-fibers are leisurely stroll. And remember that example of burning yourself? The C fiber information takes a couple of seconds uh, to get into your brain. So again, I'm just, I know I'm, I'm with an audience that may not sort of have too much of an understanding of basic sensory neurophysiology, so I just want to focus on these C fibers. They're unmyelinated, therefore, they conduct information slowly into the brain. And how do we discover them and how have we been researching them in humans? Well, again, this comes down to a tenacious Swede called Orca Valbo, uh, a neurologist and neuroscientist, who discovered uh, a population of C fibers in the skin that were not itch, they were not pain, they basically responded to a gentle stroking touch. And these nerve fibers we have christened C tactile afferents or CTs. They were first found in a pussycat. Um, and this, again, is, is a scientist who had his eyes open when he was doing this experiment. He was recording from a nerve that innervated the lower leg of the cat. He's stroking across the foot, and he sees activity, which is the fast ones I've talked about. Okay? So this is exactly what you'd expect. You put a stimulus down into the, into the area of the skin that this nerve fiber is innervating. You stroke it. You've got an electrode further upstream recording the electrical activity in that nerve. As soon as that leg is touched, boom, 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 the nerve fires. Okay, that's basic touch. We know about fast myelinated nerve fibers. But what he realized is a couple of seconds later, something else was wafting along after he'd stroked the leg of this cat. And this was the first demonstration that there is a C fiber in mammalian skin that is responding to gentle stroking touch. Subsequently, I don't think I'll take too much time in this, other than the fact that C fibers, these unmyelinated nerve fibers are about 80% of the nerve fibers in your skin that, that are responding to information from the skin are C fibers. Again, the anatomy is dictating some relevance, the amount of real estate, if you like, that's put down with C fibers compared to the fast ones. So these slow ones clearly are there for a reason. And all I want to point out with these slides is that nociceptors detect threats. And of course, what happens with, the, with a threat is that you withdraw and you protect or you scratch. I don't want to take too much time on this one, but other than to make the point that the, hedoma, the hedonoceptors detect a reward. 
So there's this balance between nice and nasty that these two C fibers seem to be playing. You've got the C nociceptor, which is telling the brain about things that ain't so good. You've got this C hedonoceptor, which is telling the brain about things which are quite nice. Yeah? It's reporting that there's a pleasant stimulus occurring on your skin. Again, I keep re-emphasizing that context is everything. If there's someone you can't stand doing this, it ain't going to be nice, no matter what that nerve thinks. So, again, just to sort of update you on how the hell we do this technique of myconeurography, and this really is the most important scientific advance in enabling us to detect that in human skin, there are these fast mechanoreceptive nerves, there are itch nerves, there are pain nerves. There are also nerves that are responding specifically to gentle touch. And this technique of microgeography, and we've got the only lab in this country that can actually do this technique, is that we pop a very fine needle, a bit like an acupuncture needle, through the skin, into an underlying nerve. This is a nerve file, a bundle which is innervating the skin. And this is what a nerve looks like. In reality, each of these little dots is an axon, so a, a, an axon that will be connected to a touch receptor, a pain receptor. Yeah? So this is the, the, the connection wire, if you like, that takes the receptor on the skin and sends it into the central nervous system. And what we're able to do with microneurography, this is a recording electrode. It's like tapping into a telephone conversation. So this is a telephone cable. There's thousands of different conversations coming down each of these wires. Some will be touched, some will be pain, and what Orca Valvo discovered is a population that when you stroke the skin, they were activated. And this was the beginning of the understanding that there are a population of C fibers in human skin that respond specifically to gentle touch. This is me with a needle in my nerve here. And this is, I just I love this stuff. Yeah, so we built a robot, a robot that can stroke the skin at different forces and different velocities. And as you stroke across here, you'll see... Now that's touch, all right? Uh, I just think that's beautiful. This is, this is the brain's view of any sensory experience is encoded in these binary spikes. So when we stroke across this receptor, the nerve here is recording from that receptor and this is what we see in terms of the information that's coming into my brain. And going back to that example I said earlier with the, um, with the finger plate, what you're going to hear here is the fast touch system. So here we're touching the skin, we're recording from a fast myelinated nerve, and you'll hear that nerve firing. Here is one of these slow C tactile afferents. So fast touch, every time the skin is touched, the nerve fires and you feel touch. And here's a C tactile. You immediately see this delay. And look at velocity. Fast. I normally tell the lads to listen to that. So this slow touch is what is optimally exciting these nerve fibers, okay? And we'll come to the evidence and the proof of that. So th this is, again, these are recordings from a C tactile afferent, three pokes going into the receptor here. And this is just to point out that if this was a fast myelinated nerve, all of these spikes would be aligned with the physical contact. They're delayed. So again, this is the proof that we're building up that these nerve fibers have slow conduction velocities, incredibly sensitive to touch, okay? You can almost blow on the skin and these little C tactile afferents respond to really gentle touch. Understanding their dynamic properties is important. The massage industry has caught up with it. Anyone who's in a therapeutic touch world needs to know this because this is the language that these nerve fibers respond to and the rest of it is probably nonsense, yeah? So one has to be careful that when these type of procedures are being developed, all I'm suggesting is that this is what this nerve likes and is there an opportunity to capitalize on that in terms of the way that we deliver touch. So when I worked in industry, I could get 
loads of money. So we did this CGI. So this is gentle stroking touch. And here you can see the fast nerves are firing in. But then with the hairy skin, you can see one of these C fibers coming in. Now that nerve fiber is sending information again into the emotional brain. So there's no conscious detection that that's happened. It's a feeling state and not a sensing state. Now we all know that with the hug and everything else, you, aren't, you don't internalize it. There's just something which just feels nice. This is why, yeah? This C fiber is responsible for that positive affective feeling through gentle touch. I think I'll go through that. And the same, by the way, for the pain system. So this is another one of these C fibers, and we know a lot about this system in terms of X function in terms of warning you that something nasty has happened on the body, another C fiber, again with another projection, again into brain areas. And I'll just let this one run through, actually, because what you'll see, once the information comes into the spinal cord, it gets shifted up to the brain. And I've just been at a pain meeting in Sicily this week. Yeah, this week. Um, Pain is represented in diffuse networks all over the brain, as is pleasant reward, yeah? So there's no topography where there's a pleasure area or a pain area. These complex affective emotional states engage a whole range of different processes in the brain, from limbic structures to cortical structures to reward structures. So we've discovered the CT only in 1990-odd. This nerve fiber is in the human and we asked ourselves, well, what's the function? Yeah? Evolution doesn't stick a nerve fiber system like this down unless it plays some critical role in some form of uh, development. Slow conduction velocity, they respond variably depending on how you're stroking the skin. And remember, they're not in glabrous skin. They're certainly not pain receptors. Uh, don't worry, they, they respond with a high frequency, so they like to be stroked. So that's a little bit about the neurophysiology. Now let's step another direction and just look at some animal behavior and some grooming. So social grooming in primates. Now, many of you may know that primate colonies set social hierarchy through grooming, but there's more than that. Uh, the grooming behavior that primates engage in is as colony sizes increased, it became ineffective. And a lot of that grooming behavior was not purely for hygiene. So there's another mechanism by which primates are grooming each other that is beyond hygiene. And this study was done by Barry Coverne uh, at Cambridge University a number of years ago. He was working with talapin monkeys. Talapin monkeys spent an awful lot of time grooming, and he had very simple manipulation here. One population of talapin, mon talapin monkeys were given a drug called naltrexone. Now, naltrexone is used in pain research because it blocks opiate receptors. And say so we've all got endogenous opiate receptors, naltrexone will block them. The other population were given non-sedative doses, doses of an opiate. Yeah? So they weren't out of their heads, they were non-sedative doses of an opiate. A natural dose, if you like, compared to what is already existing with our enkephalins and endorphins. And all he did was count the amount of grooming behavior that these two groups of monkeys um, basically were uh, partaking in. The opiate blockers increased the amount of grooming. So those monkeys that had the naltrexone, i.e. their endogenous opioid system was switched off, increased grooming. Those who had the non-sedative doses of opiates decreased grooming. So what we can infer from this is an indication that this grooming behavior is rewarding. It's rewarding at the level that it's encapsulating our own endogenous opiodergic system, which is one of the main mechanisms that drives our, our response to reward and, pleasant and pleasure. And oxytocin will be involved in this as well. So opiate receptor blockade increases the motivation to be groomed while morphine administration decreases it. Supporting the view that brain opioids play an important role in mediating social attachment. Throughout this talk, think play. I know you are thinking play, but I'm thinking play at a physical, tactile interaction between two kids or a carer and a parent and a kid. So mu receptors are involved in very natural rewards and pleasures, uh, including infant bonding and attachment. Right, let's step down to another observation 
in terms of the information that's out there in the literature. None of it is, is citing the C tactile afferent, but it's observed aspects of touch that have some impact on people's behaviour. Elderly people touch during mealtimes in care homes, eat more. Physical touch, this is Robin Dunbar, expresses more emotion than language. We know from the Romanian orphanage children and, and other examples of neglect that a child that isn't touched basically can die. That may sound a bit ridiculous, but this physical contact is having a significant <coughs> impact on that developing nervous system. And it's a nerve fibre, okay? It's not food, it's not oxygen, it's this C tactile. And I love this last one from Tiffany Field, looking at these cultural differences that, that uh, Janet picked up on as well. In This is Americans and French, yeah? So the American teenagers were all very sort of, well, a little bit pushy maybe. And yet the French, you know, if you ever, you know, the way French people say hello is just, oh, kiss, 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 kiss. There's a very in-depth tactile interaction. They're comfortable with touch. Uh, this American population of teenagers, this is just purely observation. And again, getting back to Harlow, Harlow's experiments in baby monkeys separated from a few hours after birth. Again, I don't want to read, I need to emphasize this really because what's happening here is even here you can see this monkey would far sooner have part of its body touching the cloth surrogate whilst it goes for food. So even though the wire mother was the source of nourishment, the infant spent a greater amount of time now this, if you like, was one of the first examples of what Bowlby later colonised as attachment. Um, it's not a word I like, by the way, but I don't want to fall out with people here. <clears throat> this is really exciting. Now this again is, is, is very recent. Uh, most of you will have heard of genetics, and some of you may have heard of epigenetics. Epigenetics is the modern interpretation of nature nurture, because what epigenetics tells us is that gene by environment influences are far more biased towards the environment than they are the gene that you've inherited from your parents. So this is nurture nature brought up to the 21st century. This shows very clearly that environmental influences on a developing infant's life impact the way that that brain develops at a level that we can measure. The beauty of this study that Michael Meany was doing is that you can separate two groups of rat mothers out, those that lick and groom a lot and those that don't lick and groom. Now, Michael Meany didn't actually cite the fact that this could be a C tactile afferent. He was more interested in the downstream consequences of what's going on epigenetically in the way that various receptor systems are switched on and off that control stress. However, our interpretation, licking and grooming, is gentle touch. So that rat mother is either gently touching the pup a great deal or another population of rat mothers a little. And what you see here, and this is absolutely critical, highly nurtured pup, rat pups tend to grow up to be calm adults while rat pups who receive little nurturing tend to grow up to be anxious. That's a groundbreaking statement, that, because if we see the impact of early neglect, uh, adverse environment on any infant, you know, a depressed mother, Romanian orphanages, what's happening here is they're not being touched. Yeah? I'm making a very strong argument here that this little nerve fibre that likes to be stroked is playing a fundamental role in the way that the brain develops its sense of self. And this is all measurable. Yeah? We can measure cortisol, we can look at a, a receptor called glucocorticoid which basically drives a hypothalamic axis. This is all measurable in terms of structural changes in that brain that basically are impacting on adult behaviour, aggression, anxiety, etc. The epigenetic angle here, by the way, and that's something, again, will be important for all of you as therapists, if that rat is a female from a low-licking, grooming mother, it becomes a low-licking, grooming mother when it has pups. Now, although I'm not going to extrapolate from a rat to a human, I think many of you may see this cascade of abuse coming down through families, again, mediated by this epigenetic system. There's no blame in this. There's no conscious control over this. Yeah? That's your epigenome. That's you, based on what happened to you, happened to your mother, happened to a grandparent. These are all reducible to the extent that they are definable 
I'll just let you stroll through this touch because it, through this slide because it it really emphasizes that the modulator of all of these events that we're listing here come down to the simple uh, um, basis of whether that infant or is touched or handled. And these are all definable, quantifiable, measurable consequences of a neglect as opposed to nurtured child. And all of these markers of stress uh, are ways that we can draw a direct line back to the cause uh, of these adverse um, events that have come out of uh, lack of touch. And again, the people doing this research didn't know that there was a nerve fibre that had evolved in all social mammals to respond to gentle touch. We have a target, yeah? And that target needs to be integrated into our thinking and maybe into our therapy. And I love this because, again, to me, it gives an example of just how this gentle touch thing is not something new. And it may well be the evolutionary basis of why social groups are successful. This is C. elegans. Now, C. elegans is a little worm. It's the only animal we have a complete connectome of, and it's got 302 neurons, okay? So this little worm only has 302 neurons, and they control its behavior. It moves, it feeds, it, it does things, okay? Six of those neurons are gentle touch. It's got fast touch ones, but six, six, or it's got ones that respond quicker. Six of them are gentle touch. Now, if you grow C. elegans in a colony from an egg, it will grow to its normal length in three or four days. Now, if you take that egg and grow it in isolation, look what happens. It hardly grows. Here's a very early example in evolutionary time that touch, colony touch, is driving the ability of this worm to basically develop a healthy phenotype. If you tap the dish in which this little lowly worm is in, it'll grow a little bit more. So it's a mechanical stimulus which basically drives growth. And we see this in many preterm infants, that they don't grow to their full length either. Um, and again, here's our worm, and it's got these gentle touch neurons. So it matters to us. You know, Touch has been found to be particularly important during the early years of life. And again, we have, you see all these in your notes, we have all of these consequences which are recognized by many therapists and pediatricians, etc., and people who work in, in, in child development. <clears throat> what I'm suggesting today, of course, is, is that we have a mechanistic understanding of what drives these benefits. And are we doing enough to make sure that they are actually capital capitalized on? This guy makes me laugh. This is John B. Watson, who's the founder of behaviorism. <clears throat> I just love this stuff. You know, this, is, this, is, this is the year I grew up in. You know, my parents were cuddling me all over the place. <clears throat> so never hug and kiss them, shake hands with them in the morning. Um, <clears throat> caressing would create mawkish kids. An untouched child would enter manhood so bullocked with stable work and emotional habits that no adversity can overwhelm him. It's my generation. I'll make a serious point here, actually. You can underdo physical contact and nurture, but you can overdo it, yeah? Because many parents now feel guilty because they're sticking their kids in nurseries and, they, and when they get hold of them there, you can overdo this. Life is a quadratic, yeah? There's a point at which things are working right, yeah? Overdo it and it fails. Underdo it and it fails. So just bear in mind that you can, I would suggest, over-cuddle nurture a child. The whole process of maturation is one of independence, and you can reduce independence if you're, I would say over-mothering, there needs to be a more PC word than over-mothering, it's over-parenting. Smothering, exactly. <clears throat> right, I don't know how we're doing for time. How are we doing for time? Oh, right. <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is take you gently through how, as a, as a neuroscientist, once we had identified or found out there's this nerve fibre that likes to be stroked, we need to measure it, we need to add data, we need to prove that we can quantify that something called pleasant touch is actually definable in the scientific uh, uh, terms. Uh, you may not be able to, what's going on here is that there's a rotary motor that is stroking a soft brush across the skin. Okay, 
I was working with a neuroscientist in Chapel Hill in North Carolina who was interested in how the brain detects tactile motion. Uh, and he, so he built this device that basically stroked the skin at different velocities, and that's it. Yeah? So we can stroke the skin at different velocities with a soft brush. And we were the first people to ask whether, it's, whether you can actually ask and quantify pleasant touch, because nobody had done this. So what we did is we stroked the skin, we stroked the forearm, and we stroked the face at three velocities, 0 0.5, 5, and 50 centimeters per second. And we asked people, simply using a visual analog scale, 0 to 100, how pleasant is that? Okay? So all they're doing is rating how pleasant it is. And what did we find? Well, here's our pleasantness rating, 0 to 100. Now, this is a logarithmic scale. And this is how pleasant is that touch. Here's our three velocities, 0 0.5, 5, and 50. Don't worry about these surfaces. What we found was that when that brush was stroking at 5 centimeters per second, people rated that as most pleasant. If it went faster or slower, they rated it as less pleasant. So we've got a tuning curve here, yeah? We've got my little quadratic. And this is the first indication that when, when we take that same brush and we now stroke it across a different body part, and remember my hedonic homunculus example that I mentioned earlier? If we now take that brush and stroke it across the face and we ask the same question, how pleasant is that? Remember, this is a logarithmic scale. That same physical stimulus stroked across the forearm when stroked across the face, is rated, and th these participants didn't know what's going on. They're just rating how pleasant is that. They will rate this as far more pleasant than this. Now, maybe we like our face being stroked. You know, you begin to see how what we're suggesting here is that there's more of these little sea tactile elements here than there are here. So we've got another homunculus emerging here that, that determines how pleasant touch is depends on where it is. And that is the nerve fibers distribution across the body. We then went into a very long period of developing a robot. <clears throat> this costs about, I know, $300,000. But we needed to reduce this to a laboratory environment first. The reason we built this robot is to take the human out of the picture. At this stage, we didn't want anybody putting that brush on the person because there's an interaction, yeah? The robot's doing it, so we can get objective, quantifiable data. When this person has been stroked, and we've now controlled force and velocity. So we know that this can be a gentle force or a high force. This can be a slow velocity or a high velocity. The participant can't see what's going on, because obviously vision can compromise touch. And she's just basically rating, again, how pleasant, how unpleasant. Now we do that across different body parts. And all this stuff's published, by the way. I, don't, I want you to just get the, the basic gist here. If the body responded to pleasant touch the same wherever we were stroking, all of these bars would be the same height. The fact that these bars are different heights tells us that there is a hedonic homunculus. There are certain body parts that respond more positively to pleasant touch than other body parts. So this is hard-nosed psychophysics. Yeah? This is data which is incontrovertible. The data that we're getting here has the most highest significance that we've ever seen in, in psychophysical experiments. It's repeatable, it's reliable between normal people. If I get time, I'll mention my theories about autism uh, because they won't respond in this way at all. So we've put in together now the microneurography and the psychophysics. So here's our robot. We're stroking the arm and we're recording from a C tactile afferent, okay? We do this, there's a nerve called the lateral antibrachial nerve that you can find if you put the needle electrode through the skin at the shoulder joint. This is a terrifyingly complicated procedure. I think there's probably six people on the planet out of seven billion that can record from this nerve fiber with this technique. This took us four years just to get this one nature paper. But the benefits are just unbelievable. So we're recording from a C tactile afferent and we're stroking across its receptive field on the forearm, and we're looking at how excited that nerve is, okay? We're looking at how much it's firing to these six different velocities now, 0.1 to 30 centimeters per second. So all this, 
uh, y-axis is how excited that nerve is. And look what we find. That nerve fiber, this is a first order afferent here. Yeah? This hasn't even got to the brain. This nerve fiber has evolved to respond to a velocity of around about three to five centimeters per second. If, the, if these are these fast ones, the, the myelin actually ones, the faster you stroke, the more they fire. So they're basically just encoding linearly the intensity of a stimulus. If we now do the psychophysics, so we now take our robot, we're not recording from the nerve fiber, we're asking people to rate how pleasant these six different velocities are, we get exactly the same function. So subjectively, people are responding to how pleasant touch is in the same way that this nerve fiber is responding to the actual physical touch. So this C tactile afferent maps onto the subjective report of how pleasant touch is. So this magic velocity around about three to five centimeters per second is rated as most pleasant. And this really was the basis of our CT pleasant touch hypothesis. Now we have a mechanism, we understand the process. We can start, this is why I'm so excited about being at this meeting today, is that we can start helping possibly to translate some of these insights into what you guys have basically found on the front line in terms of how your experience may be giving us some information. There's another, this came out a couple of years ago by my colleague Rochelle Ackerley, one of these few microneurographers. And if you could design this system for the benefit of affiliative nurturing touch, you couldn't have done it better than this. What we're doing now with our stroking robot is that we're making that stroking stimulus higher than skin temperature, at skin temperature, or lower than skin temperature. All right, so it's cool, it's hot, or it's at skin temperature. And what do we find? We find that C tactile afferent is most active to the temperature of the skin. So when that stroking stimulus is at skin temperature, that nerve fiber is firing most. If it's above skin temperature or below skin temperature, it's not as excited. And again, think of care to kangaroo care, think of a physical contact, think of that skin to skin contact, mapping the temperature of the baby and the temperature of the mother, we see that nerve fiber is basically tuned to exactly that. So just looking at social development, I mean, I don't need to point this out, that parental touch is a key regulator, but this is where we need to, I think, find more and more evidence base that underpins just how vitally important it is that that early part of an infant or baby's life is as optimized as possible because it often isn't. Um, this rather complicated diagram here is just his epigenetics again. But it's getting down to a mechanism here that maternal licking and grooming perhaps increases serotonin in the hippocampus. These glucocorticoid receptors are those receptors that basically regulate stress. This, there could be nothing more important than regulating stress. Yeah? Stress is a killer. It damages the amygdala, it damages the hippocampus. I mean, extreme stress, yeah? We all need stress. We, would, we wouldn't get out of bed if there weren't a certain level of stress. I'm talking about continuous um, um, increased stress. Uh, and again, a lot of our kids are, are in environments these days, particularly with these stupid SATS tests, where they're just being stressed to the eyeballs. Yeah? And it is, it will be, I would suggest, damaging. So let's look at this attachment. In attachment theory, children seek physical contact with, a, with I don't like this word caregiver. Right? I mean, it would normally be the mother, and then it would be somebody who's stepping in as a surrogate. So, but this is the PC world, I'm afraid. So, so nurturing and social interactions depend upon positive social touch. And again, although I've focused on the nerve fiber, that nerve fiber clearly locks into a whole load of downstream chemical processes that, that involve the opioids, that involve oxytocin, and that involve a neurotransmitter we suggest called serotonin. And serotonin, of course, is the, is the neurotransmitter that all antidepressants go after in terms of m mood regulation. So, and again, just emphasizing the fact that across the lifespan, although our interest here is, is, is with children, this spans across the whole lifespan in terms of the importance and reassuring value of touch. But again, you know, the point I want to sort of make today is that 
there's been little attention has been paid to the actual neurobiological basis that drives the rewarding value of touch. And what I think that mechanism that I'm describing today will provide all of us with is basically putting two fingers up at people that try and demonise how important touch is, yeah? This is important as the oxygen you breathe, yeah? This isn't some nice little add-on to have a cuddle. This is fundamental to the way a brain is developing. And it, I don't know, it just drives me to distraction. I've got a student who works as a nursery nurse and the manager of this nursery, of course, they're all managers now, they is instructing her not to touch the child if it falls over. You know, get the kid to put the plaster on itself. I mean, how do we get, how did we get here? It's lunacy, yeah? There are no more paedophiles than there were 100 years ago. They may be facilitated more with modern technology, but I think we've, we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, to use a sort of a, a topical term here, is that we need to look at how this legislation is actually damaging rather than protecting. And I think, Janet, you put a fabulous slide up that say that it isn't working, yeah? The paedophile is mentally ill, okay? Anyone who, who, is, who seeks reward from a child, sexual reward from a child, ain't normal, yeah? So there's something wrong, and quite often these, these, these men, normally men, will have come from an abuse background, yeah? So they need to be, I, I'm just talking scientifically here, there's a mechanism that drives inappropriate reward to a child, can we look at that and understand what it is? But I don't know whether these people tend to be incredibly clever, I don't think any legislation is going to stop them getting what they want. The drive that's driving them for inappropriate touch of a child is not going to be stopped by legislation. And I think what you showed, Janet, has showed that quite definitely. It doesn't work. The cost, though, of going down that route is this ridiculous. You know, I'm giving a talk in Montreal next week um, to a bunch of dermatologists. <coughs> and when we were working up, because dermatologists obviously do a lot of touch, I mean, this just blew me off my seat. A dermatologist in Canada has been sacked or dismissed from his job because he touched a patient. This is how bloody crazy this is getting. And, and the point I made earlier about once you open up a litigative window, you've got a whole lot of manipulative people out there who are going to jump into it, jump through that, yeah? And what this person said, he didn't, I didn't give him permission, yeah? So you can see that you've had it, yeah? Because people can be mendacious. I'll give you another. This, you know, there's a, a, a work with a trauma therapist, and she was relating, and this is this is where it's impacting on adoption. This couple had adopted two kids, uh, two little girls, I think it was, and they were sharing a bedroom. Uh, this little girl wanted a room to herself, so she basically told the social workers that that, 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 so, that, that the foster father had interfered with her. He's whacked off to jail. She gets her own bedroom. Now, that's a disturbed child, yeah, getting her own back because the adults in her life have basically destroyed it. And then again, Janet pointed out the complexity of these kids' lives manifests itself in some very disturbing ways. But again, uh, at the BPS meeting, uh, there was a discussion from a, a teacher there who was experienced. And he was in a situation where some he touched some kid and this kid said, oh, you touched me inappropriately. And because he had the experience, he basically told this little kid to shut the fuck up and you know, get on with your homework. <laughs> had that been a younger teacher, he would have think, mm -mm -mm -mm. And in fact, there was an example at that BPS meeting where some a male teacher had helped a, a little girl out of the swimming pool. Uh, and he went to jail for six months until they got the transcripts from the police that interviewed this girl that she was basically having a confession extracted from her that basically created evidence, if you like, that this was inappropriate touch. It wasn't. And of course, the consequence of that is we're getting less people prepared to foster. And how many men in this room? Yeah, we're getting less male primary school teachers. Again, because of the complexity of the risk that actually can be um, opened up. Uh, just a few examples, really, of, of how touch now can be quantified. Uh, this is a study uh, done by a colleague of mine, Lena Loken. And basically, what we're doing here is just stroking babies' legs with a soft brush. And we're doing measurements now. Uh, research has shown that rough and tumble play among juvenile animals is critical for learning what constitutes acceptable social behavior. And again, back to our little pussycats again. Sorry of those of you who have a cat. 
Domestic kittens deprived of social play become aggressive adult cats. How often when we get a kitten do we take it away from the litter that it's grown up in? Yeah? So you've basically got a little kitten that's come out of an environment where epigenetically it's not getting the kind of social play that it should be getting in terms of its behaviour subsequently when it's an adult. But I think there's a, there's a critical point here as well where the, this trajectory of development has stages at which some things need to happen. And that play that is basically uh, carried out by young children isn't just for the moment, yeah? That is impacting adolescence, yeah? So adolescence will be impacted by the amount of play that that child has had. Now you look at disturbed adolescence, you look at the failure of some adolescents to actually take that transition to adulthood, and you can trace everything back to what happens in the early stages of development. It's so important is what <coughs> is going on here today in that this is where you lay down the foundations for the whole of society across this planet, actually. Um, uh, I don't think I'll... Th this, you can read this stuff if you like, but basically these are the kind of measures that we're making that it, as, as scientists is that we can look at various impacts that neglect has on the expression of various building blocks of a healthy brain. Okay, so you don't need to know what these words are, other than the fact that an environmental influence is essentially those that are tactile during particular periods of development shape the lifelong structural integrity of the brain, i.e. you. Yeah? This is, and again, it may be hard to believe that this little nerve fibre is responsible for so much downstream complexity of us as humans, but we see exactly what neglect does. We see exactly what happens with Romanian orphanages. And I'll come at some stage, we see exactly what is, is interesting me now is preterm infants. Yeah? So you lift a preterm infant at 22, 23 weeks and put it in an incubator. What do you think that infant isn't getting when it's in the incubator? 25% of NICU babies develop autism. Now, this is my hook with autism and the C tactile afferent, is that that lack of touch is affecting the way that developing brain identifies self. And remember, no CTs here, CTs here. This is me. This is my body. Are these CTs playing some fundamental role in developing self? So that brain knows this is me and that's you. Um, this is early days. This is getting back to my favourite topic with myelin. Uh, here's those nerve fibres that basically the, the frontal lobes of the brain are developing until your 20s, yeah? So the prefrontal cortex is, is if, if you like, your rational brain, the executive function, etc., etc. This is a normal prefrontal cortex nerve fibre, and this is what's happening in social isolation. So social isolation is impacting on the integrity of the nerve fibres that would ultimately be innovating and controlling uh, behaviour. And no other parts of the brain are affected, just the prefrontal cortex. And again, we see the terrifying consequences of neglect and social isolation at critical stages during our development. We've just shown that one. And just, you know, this, 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 you, know, you can rattle the cage of the autism community because at the moment their focus is chasing genes. They've got like 20,000 now. None of it is mechanistic, yeah? All of it is, I would suggest, is looking at autistic behaviour analysing genes and how it compares to normal. We're all on the autistic spectrum, yeah? We all sit there somewhere. We're all schizophrenic. We're all OCD, we're, yeah? I'm going to say something quite heretical here, but I would burn DSM. I'm sorry. There are many, many causes now where that is basically a descriptive, qualitative uh, cluster of behaviours which had no mechanistic basis at all, yeah? We're all there somewhere. Obviously, when you look at extreme cases, particularly in autism, it's a terrifying condition. But somewhere along the line, nurture... Now, I got really kicked by publishing an article saying the roots of autism are in the skin. Because what I came up against was a misunderstanding by this refrigerator mother nonsense that this psychiatrist in the 50s came up with, that if your child is autistic... It's, it's, and I spoke to Temple Grandin about this, who's this famous American autist. 
Uh, and if you've not seen her film, watch it. It's phenomenal. Uh, with my CT hat on, she, doesn't, she couldn't stand as a little girl the feeling of silk dresses on her skin. Gentle touch for her was like a nociceptor. Yeah? So if you're the mother of a genetically determined autistic baby, it isn't going to want to be cuddled. Now, I, don't, I think that must be terrifying. All your nurturing instincts are to hold that baby. If I'm right, and this genetic route to, to, to autism is that this nerve fibre is now responding negatively to pleasant touch, you've got this horrible situation you know, where the mother just can't cuddle and hold that child because it's adverse, touch is adverse. There's two routes to the same phenotype, I'm suggesting. There's a genetic route, and we know there's a high risk of, of a sibling being autistic. Now, that's something wrong with this C tactile system and the wiring, genetically. The other route is epigenetically, and that's neglect and the Romanian orphanages. So two ways of not optimising the activity in this C tactile afferent can lead to this cluster of behaviours. And this word autism may die out at some stage, and we'll find a more appropriate term to describe an aberrant social brain. Uh, I think what I'm going to do, because I must be bombarding you guys, is just step out. Uh, the, all I'm doing now is, is giving some evidence of where, you know, I, I said at the beginning of this talk that these C-fibers play a protective role. Uh, I come from a pain background, an itch background, uh, and now a pleasant touch back. I love C-fibers. <laughs> pain is a great way into understanding the mind, yeah? Because pain... It's an emotional experience, it's a sensory experience, it's suffering, it's a whole range of things can be captured. This meeting I was at in Rome last week, pain research brings people together from all different disciplines because pain doesn't respect any scientific discipline or any social discipline. It impacts on life, it impacts on so many things from the molecular level, and I'm talking about proper pain, yeah, the chronic pain. I worked at the Pain Research Institute in Liverpool for seven or eight years, and these are people that are basically in pain for decades, yeah? And we can't switch it off, yeah? Most chronic pain is very, very difficult to treat. And that enables us to get an insight into well, what's gone wrong, yeah? This, 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 adapt, this maladaptive plasticity. I had a patient who had his arm ripped off in a worming machine. Five years later, the pain that he experienced when that arm was ripped off was there, yeah? Now, in other instances, an arm would get ripped off, it would be painful, and, and the person... So we get all this phantom limb stuff. There's something going on. Some people are maybe uh, genetically, you know, if, if something happens adversely, they're the ones that are going to fall over. So th again, there's a lack of consistency. Again, we don't all respond the same way. Personalised medicine is moving far more in that direction now, and we need exactly the same approach for mental health. We don't all have the same mental health problems. There are different reasons why we have different levels of suffering. It can be genetic or, or, or epigenetic. This story here is, again, I think emphasising why, how do you get information from somebody that can't tell you? Now, baby can't report pain. So this is a study that I did with the neonatal unit at Oxford University with a paediatric neuroimager called Rebecca Slater. And we're looking at how babies have these heel lances in order to take blood. And do you give it an anaesthetic? Do you give it an opiate? Is that pain having any deleterious effect on that infant? Is it hurting? Yeah? Does that baby have what you and I would describe as pain? Well, what Rebecca Slater had done has developed an EEG technique where she's measuring electrical activity from the preterm, from the infant's brain during a heel lance, a clinically required heel lance, and what she's done, she's found an electrical signal on the brain which is correlated with the heel lance. Now, the reason that we suspect it is painful is that if you recall from the leg muscle of the baby, there's a withdrawal, yeah? So there's an instinctive moving away from that heel lance, so that there's a reflex activity that basically pulls that away. Interestingly, if you put these little tots in a brain scanner, and there's absolutely no problem putting a, a, a newborn infant in a brain scanner, they'll sleep through any amount of nonsense. <laughs> so you feed them up and stick them in, and their brain, <laughs> their brain networks that are mapping what we would call a nociceptive response are about 80% of mature from an adult. Yeah? So that little brain clearly has come wired up with a whole load of complex circuitry 
that will be processing a noxious stimulus. So what we did and what I'd convinced Rebecca to do is her interest was looking at markers of, of nociception in an infant. I suggested when I came across this poster at a pain meeting uh, in South America that before that heel arch goes in, stroke the leg at the CT preferred velocity. Okay, So we're stroking a body part we know has CT afferents. We're stroking it at 3 centimeters per second or we stroke it at 30. This took four years. The life of a scientist, by the way, is bloody hard. You need to be really stuck on an idea and work it, work it, work it. But the rewards come few and far between. When they do come, they're all the sweeter. And I've given the game away, really. But what happened here is that slow brush stimulation reduces, reduces adult pain. So we've got a couple of papers showing that you can reduce pain in adults. And you all know this. If you're rubbing an area that you've hurt, yeah? Is it the C tactile afferent that's modulating that pain? Well, well, I won't go through all this data. Here's, here's our little striking baby. And we're stroking it three or 30 or no brushing. We did this first with just a, a wooden stick in order to, to, to get the technique worked out. We then did it monitoring babies that were having the, the heel lance. And we're recording the electrical activity from the brain. And we're recording facial expression and we're recording this EMG reflex. Interestingly enough, that facial expression of that baby that you would interpret as it being in pain, quite often there's no facial expression, and yet the system is responding to a noxious stimulus. We need to be careful by reading everything about behavior. It's not as simple as that. And this World Association of Infant Mental Health meeting I was at the week before last, described how these behaviours are not as reliable as we think we are. This is why these imaging tools can be quite useful, because we can look inside the brain. So basically, we're stroking, and here's the bottom line. CT optimal touch reduces noxious brain activity. So this electrical signal that we record when there's an actual heel lance going in, i.e. a noxious response, we can't say that that's pain in that baby's brain, but we can certainly say that it's a noxious response. We stroke the CTAC, we stroke the leg, and junk, it's, it's down. So again, this argument I'm making about protection is that these C fiber systems, the nasty one and the nice one, appear to work collaboratively in terms of <coughs> modulating the activity one from the other. And I want to end with something I think which is the other end of the spectrum. Now this was a, a, a colleague of mine uh, called John Cacciopo. Who, who tragically died recently. He'd been <clears throat> battling cancer for years. But get, if you look at his uh, TED talk on loneliness, it's, 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 and I've lifted some of these slides from it. <clears throat> and this is data from North America. This is the percentage of one person household by state. Uh, in the 1940s, uh, there's very few. In the 1970s, they're growing dramatically. In the 2000s, there are even more. So these are these famous singletons, yeah? These are people that are basically living alone or people in, in, in elder age that are basically left on their own. The odds ratio is just the link between a cause and an event, okay? So the odds ratio of you having an early death from air pollution is 5%. The odds ratio of you dying early from obesity is 20%. Even excessive drinking is only at 30%. Look at loneliness. The odds ratio of an early death is 45%. This is hard-nosed data. Now, again, as with Harlow, as with Meany, what I'm making a point here is that none of these people in the loneliness research are thinking about touch, I think would be fair to say. Because what do lonely people not get? And what do babies in an incubator not get? They don't get this CT. Yeah? They don't get that reassuring hug, that touch on the shoulder, they don't get that physical touch that is, I think, playing a role throughout the whole of our lives. Yeah? And I even wonder whether with Alzheimer's that that channel is still open, yeah? that the distress that an Alzheimer's patient, God knows what's going on in their heads. But if this, you know, this is the first touch sensory system to come online in utero at about 12 to 13 weeks. It may be the last sensory system to go offline you know, as, uh, in the end of our lives. So it will be interesting, basically, 
to test this not only in early stages but in life stages. Um, so I will end with my favourite topic of C-fibres. We have a C-fibre society for the nociceptor set up in 1974, which is a global society now to tackle uh, understanding chronic pain. We have one for itch. People deride itch as being somehow not important. It's more devastating than pain. Yeah? A patient with chronic itch will rip a limb to pieces to get rid of that itch. They'd sooner have the pain. So itch is, and you get a lot of that in pregnancy. And the third society that we set up uh, in 2015 is the International Association for the Study of Affective Touch, which is why I'm here, because of Jeff and Monica having the good sense to sort of find out about it. Uh, and for those you want to get into the down and dirty stuff, we have published a book with about 15 chapters uh, on the neurophysiology. But what we want to do now is take this out of the lab and see if some of these ideas translate into the experiences that you people have in terms of what you're doing. When you, and for Christ's sake, don't let anyone stop you touching anybody. It's just, you know, are we all going to roll over and say, oh, yeah, it's, I, I don't know. It needs serious debate, but I think what Jeff and Monica will hopefully do is, is take this to government level. You know, there was somebody go the other day, or last year, I think, where some music teacher was criticised for holding a, a young girl, teaching her how to play the cello, you know? And even he, even Go, had kicked off that this is getting ridiculous. He did nothing about it, of course. But, so we just need to get these touch police and kick them into touch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.